نحمده و نسلی علی رسوله الكریم اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم رب اشرح لي صدري و يسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واجعل لي وزيرا من اخلي اللهم فكهنا في الدين رب زدني علما اللهم اني اسالك علما نافعا رزقا طيبا وعملا متقبلا امين ثم امين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته today we will be starting the 6th chapter of surah al-baqara from verse number 47 يا بني إسرائيل اذكروا نعمتي التي انعمت عليكم واني فضلتكم على العالمين او children of bani israel remember my favor that i have bestowed upon you and that i preferred you over the worlds Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse is again addressing the Bani Israel. And after addressing them, Allah is ordering them to do what? Uzkuru ni'mati allati an'amtu alaykum. Uzkuru. This is an ordering word. The root word being zal kaf ra. It is an order for the the plural masculine and zakara means to remember to mention or to accept the advice so here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering the bani israel to do what to remember the bounties of allah which allah has blessed them with as i mentioned in the previous chapter that they were a blessed nation they were given and they were sent with a chain of prophets with a series of divine scriptures then they were shaded with clouds and the blessings of springs and the blessings of the food and drinks and even much more so the message is that when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showers his blessings on his people he wants what he wants he expects and in fact he orders that his blessings be remembered and that they should not be forgotten or ignored so here allah is ordering the blessed people to remember allah's blessings allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering the people to be mindful and grateful of the blessings of allah means what allah is ordering gratitude and shukr so we can very conveniently gather that shukr or gratitude of allah is then what it is a do of quran and it is an order of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as allah says in another verse of surah al-baqarah fadhkuruni azkurkum so gratitude is what gratitude the acknowledging of allah's blessings is obligatory it is obligatory for all and it is no doubt it is a spiritual and it is a physical state of worship also uh, when the words of surah tauba wal ladina yaknizuna al zahaba wal fizata wa la yunfiqunaha fi sabil allah fa bashirhum bi azab alim that people who make treasury who gather what who gather gold and silver and riches and do not spend them in the path of allah then give them tiding of a very very severe and intense torment on the day of judgment so when this verse was revealed the companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they came over to him and they said that after learning this verse we have left all desires of collecting or gathering the worldly riches of gold and silver now you guide us that what treasures should we then gathered and then prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam instructed them that it is desirous to gather three things a tongue which is supple with the remembrance of allah 
that is zikr a heart which is full of gratitude to allah that is shukr and a body which is patient in the obedience of allah that is patience and sabr similarly prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has also been reported to say that four things if a person has he is the luckiest person so the luckiest person on god's earth is who has four habits number 1 who has what a grateful soul a patient body a tongue supple with the remembrance of allah and a spouse who is supportive in the manners of religion or in religious affairs allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and our children with all these four prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to supplicate after salah rabbi aini ala zikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik oh allah help me help me be grateful to you and help me remember you and then the words of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in another supplication allahumma ja'alni saburan wa ja'alni shakura oh allah make me out of those who are grateful and make me out of those who are patient now the second message of this words the third message of the words is and the order of allah is uzkuru ni'mati allati an'amtu alaykum means what that allah is saying mention the blessings which i have showered upon you mentioning of the blessings of allah talking about his bounties this is not for the purpose of exhibition or to show off or to do riya but it is for the acceptance and acknowledgement of blessings and you know what talking about one's blessings will have a very positive impact on our companions all those around us just let me give you an example like if there's a person who is really deprived and despite of being deprived the person still talks about and still mentions the blessings of allah so this will be a great message of gratitude for all those around him this will be a message and it will be it will be a, it will be something they need to think about they will be forced to think to seeing him talk about the blessings of allah despite being so deprived so all those around him who have plenty of blessings they will be forced to think that if this person in his state of poverty or his state of illness and crises if he can manage to be grateful then how can we imagine of being ungrateful to allah so uzkuru ni'mati allati an'amtu alaykum is a powerful reminder and it will be an invitation of gratitude to all those around us and then the fourth fourth thing or the fourth message we gather from these words is that allah is asking us to mention but mention what allah says mention what mention my blessings and do not keep on talking about and do not keep on uh discussing or mentioning what you are deprived of be grateful for all what you have and do not keep on cribbing or grumbling or complaining of what you have been deprived of so this is a positive outlook which this verse teaches us and the fifth point which we gather from here is that allah says mention what mention the bounties on whom uskuru ni'mati allati allati an'amtu alaykum mention the bounties which i have showered on you bounties of allah which i have given you and do not go about do not go about looking here and there and keeping on count the blessings of others so this is again a very positive message count your own blessings acknowledge your own blessings talk about your own blessings and mention your own blessings 
Don't just go, do, uh, go around looking upon the blessings of others. This will prevent all forms of depressions and anxieties. And this will prevent the negative feelings of envy and will always, always stop us from being envious. So this is again a positive outlook. As it is said, that what we need to do is that when we are talking about, when we are thinking about knowledge and we are thinking about virtuous deeds, then we need to look up at a person who has greater knowledge and who is more, more virtuous than us. And as far as the worldly riches, the gold, the silver, the cash, the kind, the houses, the properties, all these things are concerned, it is suggested that we need to look at a person who has all these blessings lesser than us. The purpose was not, was not to make us get arrogant and proud, but the purpose is to see a person who is deprived of all what we have so that we acknowledge what we have and we develop this feeling, this blessed feeling of gratitude in our hearts. Rabbi a'ini ala zikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Allahumma ja'alli saburam wa ja'alli shakura. And then in the second part of the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after asking them to remember, Uskuru ni'amati allati an'amtu alaykum, Allah says, one of the bounties Allah mentions, wa anni faddaltukum ala al-alameen, that there is no doubt that, O oh, Bani Israel, I have preferred you over the whole of the worlds. How had Allah preferred Bani Israel over the world? What was the superiority? The superiority was because they were blessed with the prophets and they were blessed, repeatedly blessed with the divine holy scriptures and the holy books. Now, the next verse, verse number 48. Allah says, and fear a day when no soul will suffice for another soul at all, nor will intercession be accepted from it, nor will compensation be taken from it, nor will they be aided. So now in this verse number 48, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right at the start orders what? What the yawman. Allah is ordering the fear of the day of judgment, the fear of the hereafter. And why fear the day of judgment? And why fear and plan for the hereafter? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then gives four basic state of affairs which will be prevailing on the day of judgment. The first is la tajzi nafsun an nafsin shayya, that no soul will replace for another soul in any form or the other. This means what? that no person will be able to benefit any other person on the day of judgment. As Allah says in Quran, Yawma yafirul mar'u min akhi wa ummihi wa abi wa swahibatihi wa bani. On the day of judgment, people will, the bondsmen, they will try to escape. They will try to run away from, from his brother from his mother and father, from his spouse, from his wife, and from his children. Because nobody is going to, nobody is going to gain from anybody. Everybody is going to gain or avail from their own deeds. As Allah says in Quran, for everybody is what they have earned themselves out of their virtuous deeds. Allah says in Quran, Laysal insana illa masa'a. 
There's nothing for a person except for what he has struggled and strived and worked hard for to perform the virtuous deeds. And you know what? This is only fair. This is only fair because if we try to work out what is the rule in this worldly life? All the students, all the students who appear in an examination, they, they get the result of their own hard work. No student gets the result due to the hard work or the study of his brother or his sister or one of his near or dear friends. Let me give you an example. There are two friends and they, they appeared in a maths exam and one of them turned out and, they, and he got a score of 100 by 100 and the other, other friend, he just failed scoring 25 out of 100. Now just tell me, does it ever happen that the, that the friend who had scored 100 out of 100 goes up to the teacher and he comes up with the suggestion that Madam, you can take out 10 marks from my score and give it to my friends so that he can pass with a score of 35 out of 100. I don't have any issue. I can, I can easily manage with a slightly lower score of 90 by 100 or so. Can any student make such a suggestion? Can any student make such a suggestion or a request? Or has any student or will any student, however, close however loving friend he is has ever has ever such a request or suggestion been made or will any teacher accept any such request or suggestion so if it has never happened and it will never happen and it is just not acceptable or possible then how can we imagine that on the day of the judgment the fairest ruler the ruler, fairest of all the rulers, the judge, the judge who is, who is the most fair of all the judges will allow such an interchange and transaction? No, this is not definitely not going to be possible in the day of judgment. We need to remember that no daughter will be, no daughter will be allowed to enter the Jannah just because her mother was pious. No father will be forgiven if the son was very virtuous. Don't we know that Hazrat Lut alayhi salam's wife, Hazrat Nu alayhi salam's wife, Hazrat Nu alayhi, salam, uh, nu alayhi salam's son, Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam's father, they were not forgiven. They were not forgiven. No one will be forgiven or will be rewarded on account of these of his near or dear ones. That is what the first part of the word says. Nobody, no exchange, no barter of deeds will happen on the day of judgment. And then the second thing is, which Allah mentions, no intercession will be accepted also. The concept of intercession, this needs to be understood and it needs to be corrected and rectified because there is a lot of misconception about this concept of intercession. Prophet will be the first and the most to intercede. As he said, he's been reported to say, he said that I am Muhammad, I am Ahmad, I am Hashir, I am Aqib. He mentioned a few of his names and this means what? That he is the praised one. And he will be the, he will be the prophet after which there will be the day of judgment. Aqib means that there will be no prophet or no messenger after him and between him and the day of judgment. And Hashir means that after him will be the Hashir. And Hashir also means and refers to that he will be the first to be raised on the day of judgment. And we know that the Prophet will be, 
will be the first to be raised on the day of judgment. And then Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam, although Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam will be dressed and clothed before Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. And Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam has also told us that he will be the first to reach the grounds on the day of judgment. And there he will reach on the river of Qathir. And there he will recognize the people of his ummah, his followers by, by the parts of the body which will be shining because of their evolution and wuzu. And he will recognize them and then he will give them water and all the followers who will drink the water of the river of Qafir, Prophet Salaam said that anyone who will drink the, the sweet, the water of the river of the Qafir will be like what? Prophet Salaam said it will be as white as milk and it will be even more sweeter than honey and it will be more cool, cooler than ice. And Prophet Salaam has reported to tell us that anybody who will drink it on the day of judgment, he will never feel thirsty. And any person who will be deprived of this water of the river of Qathir, then his thirst will never quench. And Prophet Salaam has also warned us that there will be people whom he will recognize as his followers, but he will see that the angels will be stopping the people from reaching out to the Prophet Salaam. And Prophet Salaam said, that I will recognize them as my followers and I will recognize them as people of my ummah, but I will see that they will, be, they will be stopped from reaching out to me and I will ask them that why are they being stopped? And I will be told and I will be informed that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you do not know that after you, after you, these were the people who had indulged in innovations and bidah. And then because of committing innovations, they will be deprived of the water of the river of Qawthar and they will be deprived of the intercession of the Prophet That is why we need to understand what intercessions and bid'ah are. Prophet said, Kullu muhtasatin bid'atun, kullu bid'atin zalala, kullu zalala finnar. All things which are not in religion and they are fabricated and they are created and they are innovated, they are bidda. And all the bidda are what? They are, they are misguiding. And all the things which are misguiding, they will be in fire, in hellfire. Allahumma ajirna min al nar. Prophet Sallallahu has also warned us that anyone who respects and regards and honors a person indulging in innovations and committing bidha, Prophet Sallallahu said, Laisa minna, he is not from among us. The person participating and indulging in innovations and bidha will not be considered as a follower of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So how will there be intercession on the day of judgment? There is a lengthy hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu in which he informed that every prophet was, uh, was granted a supplication which would be accepted in this world. And Prophet Sallallahu said that all the prophets made a supplication and they asked for something in the world, in their worldly life. But Prophet Sallallahu postponed his supplication for the day of judgment. And what will he ask for on the day of judgment? What his supplication will be on the day of judgment? He explained. He explained that when on the day of judgment, there will be the accountability will start, then people will be worried and they will go to the different prophets First of all, they will go to Hazrat Adam salam, and they will ask Hazrat Adam salam, to intercede for, for them. And Hazrat Adam salam, will refuse and he will say that because of the forbidden plant which I, which I ate and I consumed, 
I'm worried about myself and I'm, I myself, I don't know what will be my accountability. So you go to Hazrat Noor and they will come to Hazrat Noor and then Hazrat Noor will also refuse intercession and he will refer them to Hazrat Ibrahim and then the people will come to Hazrat Ibrahim and they will request for his intercession saying that you were the Khalilullah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed you with his friendship. Now please intercede for us. And Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam will say what? That I had committed a tara, a tariya in my life. And tariya is what? It is a statement which although it, it is a statement which is true, but it creates, it is a statement which is false. It is a false statement, but it gives the effect of a truth. So it is a false statement, basically. So he will be worried about that. And he will say that I cannot intercede for you when you go to Hazrat Musa salam, and they will approach Hazrat Musa salam, and they will say that you are Kalimullah, you were Kalimullah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly conversed with you and you had conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now please, please make intercession for us. And then Hazrat Musa salam, will say, he will mention that I had I killed a person and I'm worried about my own soul. Nafsi, nafsi will all what all the prophets and messengers will be calling out. And then they will they will approach as an Isa salam, and they will ask him and request him for his intercession. And Hazrat Isa salam, will say that I know that my after after when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lifted me to heavens, my people, my followers, they started worshiping me and they leveled me to the rays of Allah and they started calling me by the name of son of Allah and they my followers they indulged in polytheism and associated me as a partner of Allah and a son of Allah so I'm worried for myself nafsi nafsi and then people will come to prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for intercession and he will intercede and in other words, it is reported that how Prophet Sallallahu will intercede. The words of a Sahih and a lengthy Hadith tell us that after all the people, the judgment of all the people would have, will have been taken and completed, then Prophet Sallallahu will make a prostration, a lengthy prostration. He will go in sajada. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will address him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, raise, his, raise your head and ask what you want. And then Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will say, Ya Allah, Ummati, O oh Allah, my followers. Just imagine, just stop and think. Here on the day of judgment, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask him, ask what you want, he will not ask or seek forgiveness for Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, his beloved daughter, or Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, whom he loved the most amongst his wives and lovingly called Ash. No. Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, he had told in his life, he had informed and warned in his life, Ya Fatima in kazi nafsiki min an -nar. Oh, Fatima, you prepare, you prepare to save yourself from hal fire, for I will not be able to, I will not be able to plead and protect you from hell fire. So here, Prophet Salaam will say, what? Ya Allah, Ummati. Just imagine how much, how much he will, he will and he does love everybody, all of us, and how much he will care for each one of us, and how much he will be bothered for the protection of all of us. So just let's ask all of us, do we love him all that much? Do we, do we work, do we struggle, do we strive? to protect, to establish the religion, the book of Allah, which he loved. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
Make us one of those who strive and struggle from day and night to implement the teachings of Prophet Sallallahu beloved, beloved Quran and his beloved theme. Make us one of those who strive and struggle and work hard day and night to protect the teachings and to spread the teachings of the Quran out of love for the Prophet Sallallahu so you know, intercession is a fact. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow intercession. But what we need to understand is the actual concept of intercession, the conditions for intercessions, who will intercede. This will be strictly with Allah's permission and will. As Allah says in Ayatul Kursi, man zalazi yashwa indahu illa bi izni. The discretion to grant the right to intercede will only and only be by the order and permission of Allah. The second point, who will be interceded or who will receive intercession will also be strictly by the permission of Allah only. The third point, the sole discretion to accept or reject any intercession also lies with Allah alone. And the fourth point we need to understand regarding intercession is that the receiver of intercession, that is the person for whom intercession is being made, the receiver of intercession will have to be a believer in the oneness of Allah. Intercession will only and only be accepted in the favor of a person who will not who would not have indulged in any form of polytheism. So in natural, if I summarize, who will intercede? For whom will be intercession accepted? For what intercession will be accepted? When and how much of intercession will be accepted? Will all be how? Be Allah by the orders of Allah. So the polytheistic belief about intercession that the walis and the qutubs and the alims and the saints, they will intercede before Allah on the day of judgment for anyone, for everyone, for anything they would wish. This is not right. And this, having this concept about intercession, this amounts to polytheism. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to honor his prophets, his messengers, the martyrs in the path of Allah, the reciters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to honor all of these will allow them intercession. But for whom they will intercede? For which matter would they intercede? For which event they would intercede? that would be just according to the permissions and the orders and the limits of Allah. Nothing more than that. And we also learn that Quran and the fast will also be a source of intercession. From hadith we learn that Prophet ﷺ has been reported to say that on the day of judgment, Quran will intercede and Quran will say that I, I stopped or I prevented them from sleeping and the fast will intercede and the fast will say that I stopped or I prevented them from eating and drinking and Prophet Sallallahu said that their intercession will be accepted. And similarly, we also learn that Surah Baqarah and Surah Al-Imran, Az-Zahrawain, these two main surahs of Quran will also intercede on the day of judgment. And Prophet Sallallahu said that their intercession will be accepted. Now, ittaqu yawman, fear the day because no replacement of good deeds or inter interchange or transaction of good deeds. Second points, no intercession will be accepted. In the third point, Allah says, wala yukhdu minha adulun nor will any compensation be taken from the person. It means what? There will be no compensation that 
we will not be able to pay off any form of ransom or any form of uh, cash or kind to get away from the torments of hellfire. And the fourth point is that they will not be aided. So now if I sum up in this verse number 48, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning four things, four things which will not be a source of escape from the torments of hellfire or from the punishments of the day of judgment. And you know why these four things are being mentioned? Because in this worldly life, in this worldly life, the criminals usually resort to four methods of escape after committing any crime. And these methods generally which the criminals resort to for escape of punishment is their personal contacts, their links or approaches or intercessions that somebody pleading for their release or some bribe to get away. So that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah the just, the master of the day of judgment is warning us that the worldly tactics of escaping will not be possible. The only and only source of escape from the torments of hellfire and from the punishments of the day of judgments will be faith, belief, and good deeds. Inna lazina amanu wa amilu swali hati. There is no doubt that those who believe, they have faith, and then they do virtuous deeds. Only these will the people, these will be the people who will be rewarded with the with the gardens of Jannah, with the gardens of paradise, and they will be there forever. So this is the concept which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse number 48 has explained. Verse number 49. Wa is na jaina kum min ali fir'auna yasumuna kum su al azabi yuzabbihuna abna akum wa yastahyuna nisa akum wa fi zalikum bala ummi rabbikum azwi. And recall when we saved your forefathers from the people of Pharaoh who afflicted you with the worst of torments slaughtering your newborn sons and keeping your females alive. And in that was a great trial from your Lord. Now from this verse number 49 onwards, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to narrate the events and the story and happening of the people of Bani Israel. Now the first reason which we need to understand is that why in Surah Al-Baqarah here in this verse, in the start of the Madani period after the migration of Prophet Sallallahu to Medina, why is Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala here mentioning the events of people of Bani Israel? The first reason which I gather is that in when we started reading Quran and when any any student or reciter of Quran starts recitation of Quran and we go through Surah Al-Fatiha, what did we all say? Surah Al-Lazina and Amta Alayhim, Ghairil Maghdubi Alayhim Balad Dwalim. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, we want to, we want you to save us from the path of whom? We want to stay steadfast on Surah Al-Mustaqeem and Surat Mustaqim is what? It is the path of those whom you have blessed. And we do not want to be on the path of whom? On the path of Maghdub and Dualin. So we all made the supplication that save us from the path of Maghdub. So here Allah, and there I explained that Maghdub, we mean what? The Jews. So since we have asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we have made the supplication that is exactly the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is showing us 
the behavior and the mannerism of the Magdub Jews to help us refrain from such behaviors. They, we are being introduced to what they did. So we learn and we know what they did. So it becomes easy for us to save ourselves from their path. The second reason why the story of Bani Israel and Jews has been mentioned here is that uh, after the people had migrated to Medina, Prophet and his companions, they're going to, they were going to interact with whom? In Makkah, they were interacting with the Mushrikeen of Makkah. But here in Medina, they were going to encounter and interact with the people of the book, especially the Jews. So right at the start after migration, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is informing the Muslims about the behaviors and the mannerisms and the attitudes of these Jews, even in their past and the presence, so that the Muslims know what state of affairs and what behaviors they're going to come across. And the third reason why the story of the Jews is being narrated is because of the similarity of behavior of the Ummah of the Prophet وسلم, and the people of the book. As uh, Prophet وسلم, said that the Muslims will copy and they will follow the people of the book in all of their mannerisms. And Prophet وسلم, said that there were, there were or there will be 71 sects of the Jews and there will be 72 sects of the Christians and there will be 73 sects of the Prophet Sallallahu Ummah. That is the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu will be copying and imitating everything which the people of the book will be doing. And then Prophet Sallallahu said that if they will enter the whole of an iguana, the Muslims will also try to enter it. And if they have illegal relationships with their mother, mothers, then Muslims will also follow them and copy them. And they will also attempt to have illegal relationships with their mothers. Astaghfirullah Rabbi. So that is why the behavior and the mannerism of the Jews is being narrated here so that the Muslims and the Ummah of the Prophet وسلم, after learning how they behaved and then because of that behavior and mannerism, how were they punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that Muslims stopped copying them and stopped following them and stopped adopting a similar behavior to save themselves from a similar punishment. And uh, the fourth reason why the story of the ancestors of the people of the book has been explained is that in after migrating to Medina, Prophet Sallallahu was inviting the Jews and the people of the book to have faith and believe on him and his prophethood and to believe and have faith in Quran. But they were refusing to have faith and they were not they were not believing either in the prophethood of Muhammad وسلم, or in Quran. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrated them, highlighted and explained to the Jews the behavior of their forefathers who failed to accept the orders of Allah and Hazrat Musa salam, who refused, who refused to obey and who refused to have belief and faith in Allah and Hazrat Musa alayhi salam and his book, the Torah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will explain that how they were punished so that the current Jews of Medina, they learn, they learn the moral and they stop from this obstinate and stubborn refusal of belief on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and Quran. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, is uh, talking about a condition of the Bani Israel, how they were persecuted. So here in brief, I will be uh, talking about the history of Bani Israel. Now, if we, I did mention it in the previous class, but now let's repeat it ag slightly again, that during the rule of Hazrat Yusuf alayhi salam, 
when he was the ruler of Egypt, then he asked his father, his mother, and his brothers and stepbrothers, that is the people of Bani Israel, he invited them to shift from Palestine to Egypt. And this is how the Bani Israel migrated from Egypt and they stayed here. Now, as long as Bani Israel, they adopted the teachings of Allah and their prophet, Hazrat Yusuf, salam, Allah blessed them. Allah blessed them and rewarded them in this world with power, with authority, and with all forms of blessings. But when they left and they abandoned the teachings of Allah and they started disobeying the teachings of Allah and the Prophet, then all the blessings of power and authority and rule were taken away from them. And not only were they deprived of rule and authority and government of Egypt, but by the will of Allah, a cruel nation of an enemy of Kibtis was imposed on them by the will of Allah. The ruler, the rulers of Kibtis were called the Pharaoh. They're very frequently mentioned in Quran. And in the tyranny of the Pharaoh, the Bani Israel were badly, were badly oppressed. The Bani Israel were turned into slaves and they were beaten and they were tortured and they were punished and persecuted and they were forced to work. For example, just to give you an idea, they were forced like animals. They were forced to pull heavy, heavy rocks, slates on sledges all the way from Nile, from the bank of Nile to the place where the pyramids of Egypt were being constructed. And you know what? The pyramids of Egypt are actually what? They are a legend of the persecutions of the Bani Israel by the Pharaoh. And in this period of persecution, what happened one night was that the king, he had a dream that a man from one of the slaves, that is from one of the Bani Israel, had, will rebel against his, his, uh, his reign. And after he had seen this dream, he consulted his... Uh, um, his courtiers and he consulted his governors and they <coughs> and since he was getting insecure about his throne they all came to a decision and in order to prevent the rebellion and to save the king's throne they came to a decision that all the sons born to the Bani Israel they will be killed and the orders were passed on to the army to kill all the male babies born in the family of Bani Israel. So after these orders were issued, the soldiers or the army people, whenever they got the information that a male baby was born in a family of Bani Israel, they used to break open the doors and they used to snatch the baby and they used to kill the baby in front of the parents. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning as This was the worst form of torture. This was the worst torment which the people of Bani Israel were subjected to that they used to slaughter their newborns in front of the eyes of the parents and they used to leave their females alive. And this was what? Allah says, it was a trial from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was a trial. It was a punishment. It was a torment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember, this world is an examination hall and all the conditions of the life to which people are subjected are trial. The message of the verse is what? That when a nation stays, whenever a nation stays steadfast in the obedience of Allah, it stays guided. And it stayed 
it stays blessed. But when a nation diverts from the path and from the guidance of Allah and the Prophet, they are punished. They are punished and they are put to trial. Nations and societies are put to trial. They are punished on account of their disobedience, on account of their evil deeds or wrongdoings. So when a nation is in a crisis, whenever a nation or a society is in a state of crisis, what do they need to do then? What do we need? What do we need to do? We learn from the verse is that as a country, a nation, a society who is in a state of trial or who is being punished needs to do what? Accountability, self audit, check the state of obedience to Allah and assess what they are disobeying Allah and accept and confess the disobedience and the wrongdoings and the evil deeds and regret and seek forgiveness and seek forgiveness and repent and promise to return towards the obedience of Allah. This is what we learn from here. Allahumma khfir lana walil mu'minina wal mu'minat wal muslimina wal muslimat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all the crises as a nation, as a country, as a society, as an ummah, the Muslim ummah is going through today. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we accept our wrongdoings. We accept the disobediences. Allahumma ja'alli min at tawwabina. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make us, make us from those who seek forgiveness, Allah forgive us all. Allah forgive us all. Allah we regret for all what we disobeyed. Allah we regret from all what we transgressed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us all return towards obedience, return towards obeying the orders of Quran and Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rabbi khfir warham wa anta khayru rahimin. ربنا لا تزع قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك الرحمة إنك أنت الوهاب سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستقبلك ونتوب إليك سبحان ربك رب العزة يما يسفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين سمابين